Next thing we'll move on to is light. You've been seeing a lot of these shadows going on here. Uh, we'll now move to a more simplified view. And see what we've done here, those objects disappeared. Save views don't just maintain your actual rendering mode and colors, they can also retain layer visibility. So in this particular save view, I've turned off a couple layers or classes to get rid of the furniture and the people and we're only showing, and the uh, trees outside, we're only showing the building inside. This is, the first type of lighting you need to understand is ambient lighting. So here we'll go ahead to this and we'll show you the different types of light there are. The first kind of lighting you need to understand is ambient lighting. Ambient lighting is fake. It isn't an actual light object. There's no bulb, there's no sun, there's no beam of light coming. Ambient lighting just sort of comes up out of nowhere. And that's intentional. It's sort of uh, if you were to turn the brightness on your on your screen way up, it's, or way up or way down. It's basically that. So if you go to view and set lighting options, you have direct control of the ambient lighting here. Now if I turn it off, now you see how the shadows are very stark. So just that heliodon object, that sun that I have set up over my shoulder, that's showing up now. If I turn on ambient lighting, you can see the light comes from everywhere and goes everywhere. It doesn't cast shadows, but you can manipulate that directly. So you can turn it way up and just make it more of a washed out or turn it way down, make it a little gloomy. This sort of affects the mood, but this lighting isn't real. This won't look right in a photorealistic rendering. It just looks okay now because we're in OpenGL. Generally, when you're doing when you've already added your light objects, you almost always want to have ambient turned off. You usually just don't want to have to deal with it because it'll make uh, thing, light that reflects or light that bounces off of something or indirect lighting that's calculating shadows in corners not look correct. You can also change the color of this light. Now, you can pick something ridiculous and make it look like Mars. It's, it's just, see how that happens so quickly? It's not actually doing a render, it's just toning a color. It's not complicated. It's, that's why this happens instantly. It's basically fake. We'll go ahead and cancel and we'll go back to the normal light colors. The next kind of light is called a directional light. And this one here, you'll notice we aren't able to select anything. To do that, we'll go up here and we'll enable a quick prep for show light, display light objects. And see, it's only going to show them in wireframe right now. We want to show them always so I can go ahead and grab it. And then we'll zoom out here. Where's my directional light? There it is. See so my directional light here? We'll go ahead and grab this, zoom back into the model. Now this directional light is, it, basically it's light that comes from an infinite direction away and doesn't come from a point. So where I put this object doesn't really matter. It's all about where this object tilts to. So if I grab that and I go to rotate it, I'm changing the direction that the light is coming from. You can grab those points on the object or you can go up here to the object info palette and you can control the azimuth and elevation here too. You can watch it rotate around in real time. So this is what's called a directional light. It's one of the many light objects. So there's light and then it'll have a kind and directional is the first one of those. You would insert those with the regular light tool in the visualization palette. All versions of Vectorworks have this included. And a light object has a different kinds of behavior. So a directional light is the closest to the sun, even though the sun is a point of light in the sky, of course, you can, you know this, you've been on the planet. It is so far away that effectively all of the photons, all of the light that's coming in, and we'll get into actually paying attention to photons later, uh, is effectively coming from the same direction. It's not coming from a point and spreading out. And the shadows are going to be very rigid. They're going to be very parallel. They're not going to split from a point. But what we can do is show you what happens when you have light from a single point. So now you can see this is a single point light. It's not very complicated, but if we were to move it, you can see that the shadows will start to distort because the light comes from this point and splays outward. So if we were to move this around, this kind of light is a little more realistic. If you were going to have a light bulb or a lamp or if any sort of light that's emitting from a source that's very nearby, this is one of the more useful ones. And of course you can move this live in real time, track it as it moves. I'm cheating and sort of staying along the alignment paths. You can see this sort of pool of light and it sort of gets sh more shadowy as it goes by because that light is coming from this source. We've picked the source. Now, one of the pitfalls you can have with lights is if you accidentally go to drag it and you move it onto an object, it's sort of inside, here we'll zoom in, it's sort of half inside this sphere demo object that we have here. You don't want light objects to be touching anything. You always want them away. So they should always be clear, not touching anything, not 
not along a surface. They should always be slightly away, not far. You don't have to move them more than just a, a nudge or a millimeter away from a surface, but make sure you do do that when you're lighting objects. Now, spotlights are one of the more common ones for uh, interior lighting where the bulb isn't exposed, where basically either you have up or down lighting or you have track lighting like this, like you'll see a little later. And we can grab this point. And this works very similar to the way um, when I was grabbing the directional light earlier. It has a little blue control handle, and you're just able to grab that and point that at what you want. This is probably the easiest type of light to use. Uh, this is used very commonly in entertainment design or for doing um, product display. It's relatively dramatic. And in OpenGL, another reason we're showing you OpenGL, if I were to wait for this to render in RenderWorks over and over again, I would have to wait maybe 30 seconds to a minute every single time I change something about the light. In OpenGL, the quality is not that great, but it happens instantly. It's basically a utility mode is how we treat it. And that's another reason you'd want to use OpenGL so you can get your lighting first. When I go to insert my lighting, I'm always using OpenGL to just make sure I get the shadows just right. You might be off a little bit and you might want to tweak it after the fact but this saves you time there I didn't have to wait for anything I just moved it from this lady to that lady and it's done now the last type of lighting if you were going is is custom custom lights are a little more complicated what they are we'll go ahead and show you some samples of that lighting now so what this is is basically an IES light which is almost always a spot or a point light and it has different patterns of light uh, as if it had lensing or it was actually a physically different bulb and it can add a lot of realism to your design and it's also very useful for existing conditions. Uh, if you know the actual lights that are in a particular fixture or you know the bulbs that were used or you know what the, the room is going to have in it, most of the time if you go to the manufacturer you can get an IES profile and you'll be able to just insert that into the light and the light will behave as if it's physically one of the lights that you can buy in the real world. It, it doesn't let you change its settings at that point. You can't make it soft or hard. And we'll go ahead and back and explain a little bit of that too. So light objects, uh, we won't go too in depth to them because they all have, all, all of the different light object types, they have very similar settings. So no matter which kind of light we're working with, they'll all have these settings here. And we'll go ahead and go down these now. First setting is on and off, very simple not complicated to remember. It's whether the light is on or off. Keep in mind in OpenGL you can only have eight sources of light at maximum. If you were to draw 12, then eight random lights would turn on. You wouldn't be able to keep, you wouldn't be able to control which ones were on. You'll only see eight of them. So if you refresh the render, you'll still only see eight, but it might be a different eight. So you want to turn off all but eight lights when you're in OpenGL, or if you're doing eight lights at the same time, generally then you're out of OpenGL and you're already working in rendering mode. So that, but that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, in here, casting shadows, you can have the lights not cast shadows at all. This is a little unrealistic. Lights would always cast shadows in the real world, but you can see if I don't want that effect, if I just want this pool of light and I don't want a shadow to come off of it, but I want shadows to keep working, I would use this. Uh, this option is only for shadows that would be generated by photons coming specifically from this light object. It's not the same as turning off all shadows. And soft shadows, uh, that won't apply until uh, you're actually into the rendering modes, but what it'll do is it'll sort of fade and smudge this edge a little bit, as, as lights generally are in real life. Almost always you'd leave this on. Uh, the only time you'd want this turned off is if you're going for something very harsh and artistic where it seems like the light is almost painful or like a fluorescent. Sometimes the light won't seem very soft that way. Then you could turn those off. Lit fog, I believe we have some image examples of later. Um, this is just a processing option. Lit fog will not show up in OpenGL. Lit fog is basically the way, um, if you've ever been to a concert or anywhere with a smoke machine, where they have a large bright light and it passes through either smoke or fog. You can see it sort of, uh, basically it lines out the beam so the beam looks like it's almost a physical object. We'll show that a little later, but that won't show up in OpenGL, but this is so you control it per light. You also need to enable it in the RenderWorks background, which is yet again, something we'll be going on soon. Use emitter uh, is not as complicated as it seems. If you're going to use the emitter value, it means that all lights that are set to use emitter will simply be locked to the emitter. So when you change the lighting options, so if I go to view, set lighting options, if I change this value here to let's say 50, any lights that are attached to the emitter will get darker. So we'll go ahead and undo that. And the light will turn back on. Uh, 
when you have it when you're not using an emitter lights will basically just have a very simple brightness scale they go all the way down to dark and all the way up to light they're not very complicated when you enable emitter you get a brightness value and this is sort of a multiplier in OpenGL they're not going to be exact lumens or anything like this so you have another slider bar that controls the dimming but you also have a, a base value that's basically a multiplier for changing this and you can change this to candelas or lumens it's it's an approximation it will not be exactly what that looks like but you can put almost any value in here it'll just be a little washed out if you turn it too high we'll disable that and again this is um uh, a couple settings in renderworks that we'll see if you set the brightness to a value over 100 it will work and it will be quite bright but when you start to get a little crazy let's do 5000 the light is impossible and it's going to make it basically it's going to wash out color basically what would happen if you had one of those crazy industrial flashlights and you shined it directly in your face it just you it overpowers the camera it overpowers your vision and you can't see going up to like 300 is reasonable it just it's just an amplifier of the default value but you don't generally need to go very high just keep in mind that if you're cranking that to something like 5000 it might just mean you have it hooked to an emitter or you have it hooked or you just have too much light going on in the scene anyway. Generally, you don't need to crank scenes up that high. And like they did with the, um, we'll turn this up to make it a little more obvious. And like we did with the uh, color of the ambient lighting, you can adjust the color here as well. You can just pick any color from the color wheel. It'll color the light and it'll, of course, tint anything that it strikes with that color. Distance fall off. Generally, you'll want to use smooth. Realistic will turn it down such that the light, uh, and this doesn't really appear very brightly in um, in OpenGL. Distance fall off is from this point, not just where it pools the light. If you turn this to none, the light will be infinitely powerful as far as it goes. So this whole cone of light that's coming out of here, that's how bright the floor would be, no matter how far away my actual light object is. That's fine if you need to put the light suspiciously far away or get it to go through a window or make something that looks kind of like a laser, then you would want that none for the fall off. But generally leave it to smooth or realistic. Now what this here, this little widget, this is the actual spread and the beam. Generally you want to keep these two values close to each other. Uh, what we can do is you can either grab this setting and change that and you'll watch the puddle of light down there. You can see that the in, there's an inner circle which is the main focus of the beam, and then there's sort of an outer spill off. This is called the spread, this is called the beam. And this is just used to get different sort of light effects. Uh, if you were to add a custom IES light, so if you make this too big and you make that too small, your light will look weird, shadows won't look right. Generally you want to keep these within about 20 to 30 degrees of each other. You don't have to work very hard to do that, but generally you want to keep them realistic. And this just adjusts the spread, so you can get it to be a wider or smaller angle. Uh, if you're using a custom light, like we mentioned earlier, with an IES profile, I believe this is locked. That's This is a large part of the IES profile, and I believe that with an IES profile, it's allowed to have more than just these two. It's allowed to have three or four spreads and three or four beams, so you can do uh, sort of what happens when a light passes through a lensing or a, the bulb around it is lensed, so you'll get that effect. And the rest of these are just the standard uh, positional information. And like we had before, instead of just grabbing the, the object, you can manually set the rotation of these, the tilt and the pan. But generally, since OpenGL is so fast now, it's easier just to do this and grab it, and you can stick it. You can even click on it. It'll, it'll attach to surfaces. So you can see it's trying to attach to all these objects. Attach to this guy's face. It'll attach to the floor. It won't go through things. It's using the surface snapping relatively intelligently. And I'm irritated with blue, so we'll put it back to white. Love. And then here, now these two options, uh, you can set the view to the light, or you can set the light to the view. If we set the light to the view, it will make it so that that light is coming from where we are and shining where we're looking. If I undo that and set view to light, it will move our camera so that we're looking along that light. But we're in a perspective view, so that's not really what you want right now. Generally, you won't be doing that too very often. That's mostly what cameras are for. And at the very bottom, we'll have caustic photons, which is currently off. We will have a whole section on caustics in just a little bit. There we are. We did the IES objects. Ah, heliodon. Heliodon is the last type of lighting object. It's a little more recent. Heliodon is a directional light, but it has a lot of extra information tied to it. So these are each a heliodon object. 
I have them each in a particular different class. Uh, the reason these are classed differently, you'll notice up here at the top. You generally wouldn't have more than one sun. Uh, unless you're on Tatooine, you're only going to have just the one that we have here on Earth, Sol, very simple sun. So normally you don't want to have more than one. If you have two directional lights, something in your brain when you look at the render and when, when customers or clients look at the render will tell them something's wrong, A, because you'll have two shadows that look like they're coming from the sun, but B, it's just too bright. There's too much of it. There's too much going on. You'll notice if you have more than one. And another rendering tip, oftentimes if it's an exterior rendering, you can get away with just one heliodon, nothing else. So here, we'll go ahead and Heliodon in Shadows, which I believe is an external view of the model. There we are. And... There we are, and I'll go ahead and... If you ever lose your, um, your Heliodon object, you can just cheat and go to Custom Selection. Type is Heliodon. There's, just, there's four, but I only have one class turned on right now, so I'll just get the one. There's my Heliodon. So the Heliodon has different controls than a light object does. It has, it actually knows where it is. So this one was tuned specifically for Chicago where we did the demo originally. It knows its location on the planet, it's geo-referenced, and it knows the time zone that it's currently in. That's so that it can give you relatively or almost exactly accurate solar information so that if you wanted to know, okay, my building is at this location, I wanna know what it's going to look like at 1 p.m. It'll alter your light so that you can look at it at 1 p.m. Uh, sun brightness is just, an, again, a multiplier value. You can make that 100. It just does an overall modifier. Now, do you see these little shaded areas? As soon as I went to 125, I'll go to 150 to make it more obvious. See how they almost turn completely white? That's just because I've gone over a value of 100, so it washes out color. That's all that is. Again, soft shadows. Physical sun and physical sky we'll cover a little later. That's how the Heliodon object can integrate with the RenderWorks background, and we'll cover that in a bit. Uh, the main thing you can do with a Heliodon object, in addition to it being important for Energos, uh, is have it be just the only light object you need in your document. You almost don't need other lights when you're doing an exterior render unless you are looking at a light source that you want to be turned on or you have a light source at night. So if you're at, if you're at night, obviously there's no sun, you'll have multiple lights inside your model or pointed up lighting at your model. That'll be a completely different and then you would turn the Heliodon off. But here we can adjust the actual date and time. So not only can I adjust what time of year it is, if you click this and drag slowly, It'll update here. I've got a lot of tree geometry going on, so it's having to chug. Sorry, back to works. And then if we adjust the hour, it'll move the sun up and down. Now it's able, by default, it moves all the way down to sunrise, up to sunrise. So the sun just peeking over the horizon there. It'll be a little unrealistic because of course, in this model, there's no horizon. Nothing is stopping us from seeing. There's no mountains, there's no trees. So exact dawn is when it's going to come up over the edge of the fake earth that we have established here. And the same when we go the opposite direction. It'll go all the way down to sunset, the opposite direction. Very good for seeing if your master bedroom is going to be rudely awoken by sunlight all the time. Uh, you can also export a movie of that. Uh, generally, you won't do this in, uh, you can do it in OpenGL if you just want to do a quick study. It'll just show you an animation of it moving all the way over. But since we just grabbed this, if you just need to see it quickly, all you got to do is just move this. And you can see where the shadows are going to go, see where shading is going to be, see where trees are going to cross over objects. And you can change the mood depending on this. Now, if you don't like the Heliodon, if it's a little too much control, you can always go with a directional light and point it wherever you like if you need to not worry about this. The Heliodon just has a lot of other special features in addition to being a light.